Hello, and thank you for joining me for this teaching from Pennington AG Church Online. Today, we're gonna be addressing a topic that is not a part of a series. We're going to be one-off today looking at a theology of suffering. And before you turn away, because it sounds like too much of a downer or a bummer or life is hard enough as it is, I wanna talk about how understanding God's plan and design for us in and through suffering actually brings us peace, joy, and agency, or our own control over life in the midst of suffering. And I'm gonna list a few resources for you. It's gonna be a little bit of a longer list, so there'll be a link attached to this video. You can look at and see all of these books as well. First one is by Philip Yancey, 40 year old book called Where Is God When It Hurts? The first book I ever read about suffering and pain and how do we make sense of that in light of a loving God. Liturgy of the Ordinary by Tish Harrison Warren is a book about God's work in the everyday of our life. And chapter four specifically, she addresses not just the suffering on a global scale, but how do we address God in the moments of our frustrations and inconveniences of day-to-day -day life? C.S. Lewis writes a modern classic of the 20th century called The Problem of Pain. You can grab that phenomenal work about understanding God's work in pain. It's where we get the basic theology of free will and God's nature of allowing us free will allows us to choose pain that originates from that work. And then God of the Long View by David Wingington. It's a book about God's wider scale and scope of how he works throughout all of eternity and over thousands of years. And we usually just see a little piece of it. Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering is uh, a modern classic by Tim Keller written in the last 20 years um, and a phenomenal work on understanding God's love and care in the midst of pain. And then finally, a hyper-relevant, pretty easy read, God and the Pandemic by N.T. Wright, written just in the last few months about understanding God's place and work in the midst of of the global pandemic that we are living through at the time of this recording as COVID-19 has run rampant over the world in 2020. And so that brings us to why we're talking about this today. 2020 has been a year of suffering. It's been a year of pain for most of us. At the time of this recording, there are now 857,881 deaths from COVID-19 worldwide related to or in complications of Unemployment in the United States, where I live as we record this, is averaging around 10%, where the normal unemployment rate in the United States is somewhere around five. So we're double the unemployment rate and many people have lost jobs, incomes, businesses that they've worked their whole life to create. And whether it's the pain of being separated from one another, of being isolated and not able to be with the people you love, or the fear of the loss of people you love or the potential loss of their lives in the future, as well as the global feeling of mourning of the loss of the world the way it was. I live in New Jersey, just in the shadow of New York City, and many cultural experts are writing that New York City may never be the same again as people are outsourcing jobs. They don't need to live in city centers. And so we are also mourning just the loss of what was. I can't even go to a movie theater. All the losses of normalcy. The breakdown of political discourse, growing anger, the bipolar nature of conversation now. And for those minority groups and black Americans, this has been a particularly difficult year. And you've gotten hit with the four waves of the Kobe Bryant death at the start of this year as a black icon, as well as the disproportionate death rate of black Americans due to COVID-19, police brutality, and the resulting anger and frustration from that. And then as well, the week of our recording, the death of Chadwick Boseman, who represented the black hero in Black Panther. It's been a year of suffering and a year of pain. And I want you to know, first and foremost, in a theology of suffering, you are not alone. As we look to the Bible as our ultimate authority and inspiration in God's word for us, when you read the pages of this book, you read page after page of people processing the same pain and suffering trying to understand a world where God is powerful and good, how do we suffer like we do? From Job to Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, 70% of the Psalms are lamentations or painful longings. To the woes of the prophets like Jeremiah and Ezekiel, to the hope of the cross in the Gospels and the desire for redemption in Revelation. 
When you ask loving God, what are you doing? Why am I suffering? Know that you are echoing the same cries of the biblical authors as we read this book. But the reason we struggle with it is because in modern Western Christianity, we lack a theology of suffering. And that's largely because many of us haven't had to suffer greatly. In short, we're wimps. We're wimps when it comes to pain and suffering. And that's why when small little losses or inconveniences happen, we break down. It's why when my nose gets stuffed up, I feel like the world is ending. It's why when my computer won't boot up, I start freaking out. If I lose my keys or I'm running low on gas or my battery won't charge on my phone, I can't find my cable. These things send us into a meltdown. And even in this last year, as very real suffering has happened, we have amplified the voice as Western Christians, which make us look like wimps. I won't wear a mask or we can't worship together or people are crying out and my voice doesn't feel like it's being heard. People don't agree with me on political opinions, on Facebook. We are wimps when it deals with pain and suffering. Without a belief in a robust understanding of our God, his sovereignty, the afterlife, and his redemptive provision in our lives, we slip through life And we begin to define our life solely on happiness. How happy am I right now? How comfortable am I right now? And we judge a good or a bad life by happiness and comfortability. There are two responses theologically that I believe are poor responses that we're going to replace with a robust theology of suffering. The first one is the standard charismatic view of suffering. And that is God responds to our prayers. And so when we pray, he immediately responds. And so we push that to the extreme. And oftentimes we just try to ignore our pain away. I just pretend it's not there. I ignore it. I try to push it aside. I just try to smile through it, laugh through it, shake hands through it and ignore my pain. And the second is in the traditional view of church that we own our pain, we own the suffering of the world, but we believe that God just doesn't care. He's just aloof and he creates us and send us moving and we just have to deal with it. Rather than ignore the pain or rather than attribute a God that doesn't care, let's look at what scripture says and understand a theology of suffering. Let's dive in. Five fold of how we look at a theology of suffering. The first one we look at is acceptance that the world is broken. Accept that God put this world into motion as a good creation. And because of evil, Genesis 3, the world is fallen and broken and not what God intended it to be. Human beings hurt each other and there are evil people. The world is broken and there are storms, disasters, and pandemics. Our bodies are weak. Children die. Cancer exists. We lose one another. The world is broken. And we accept that God's good creation has been broken and degraded by the evil that enters this world. The Bible Project does a great job of understanding our wrestling with this idea. Where we say to God, just get rid of all the evil in this world. If you are all powerful and you're capable and you want to, just do it. Get rid of evil. Wipe it all off the face of the planet. When we don't realize that we ourselves are producing some of the evil that others experience. And for me to say, God, rid the world of all evil, it includes myself. Philip Yancey writes, The more I think of it, the more I think that this question of pain didn't really occur to the Bible writers because they assume that the planet is invaded by evil. And when they write the Bible, they write the story of a broken earth and broken human beings in need of the gracious, redemptive love of their creator. One book of the Bible in particular fixates on this idea. We have uh, a a long poem in the Old Testament. Actually, the most ancient writing we believe exists in the Bible is the book of Job. It's also the most ancient form of poetry still in existence. And as you read the book of Job, it is written by an ancient people trying to understand the suffering of good people in this world. And so you have a first chapter and a last chapter that give a narrative framework of Satan or the tempter or the accuser is saying to God, people that are good and love you are only good and love you because their lives are good. 
And at the end, you see a good man gets all of his good stuff back. But in the middle is long forms of poetry of a suffering man and his friends suffering along with him, trying to understand a theology of suffering. And they throw out, well, it's because people do bad things to each other. That's why we suffer. They say it's because of the randomness of the world. And that's why we suffer. It's because of our hidden guilt and God's punishing us. And that's why we suffer. And all throughout, they try to come up with reasons. And finally, at the end of the story, Job, the main character, asks God to come down and explain himself. He says, God, explain to me why the world is so filled with hurt. Why is there so much pain? And God, in chapter 38, responds. It begins with a whirlwind as God demonstrates his power, like a chaotic storm is there and God's voice comes out of it. And God responds with this, Job 38, verses 2 through 7. Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself like a man, because I have some questions for you and you must answer them. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Who determined its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? What supports its foundations and who laid its cornerstone? As the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. He goes on to explain the ocean and giant great beasts and asked Job to explain them. And in this, God is explaining to us and the authors of this story are laying out a theology of the world is vast God is laying out a long plan for it, and we are somewhere in the middle in our existence. And we cannot understand the vastness of an omnipotent and all-powerful and ever-existing God in the microcosmic moments of our life. And Job says, my life right now is really suffering, and God, do you care? And God says, my plans are so much bigger than the momentary suffering that you exist in, Job. And there are so many more things at work from beginning to end that I'm moving and creating for the good of my creation and for my own glory and order to my creation. And God says, you must become acquainted with the fact that the world you're living in is not what I've created. It is broken. And the second answer, so first becoming acquainted with the brokenness of the world. Second is believing that this world is not our only plane of existence. The secular understanding of suffering struggles because we only have this physical life. And so I define my worth and I define my value by the happiness and comfort that I live in. And what the Bible shows us and what the theology of Christ-centered life shows us is that we are made for more than just the 20, 30, 80 years we live on this earth. Temporary suffering is not as valuable as eternal peace. Luke 23, 43, Jesus says to a man dying on a cross next to him, he says, I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. That we, while we exist for a certain period of years as fleshly bodies on this earth, we are made for eternity. And what God says is when you suffer in this earth, know that there is an eternity looking before you on the other side. And in that eternity is peace, is joy, is my presence forevermore, is all who have come to accept Jesus Christ as Savior and to trust in his name. And a momentary suffering in this world is nothing compared to the joy of the eternity set before us. And second, we know that there will be a time when all suffering will be healed in a new heaven and a new earth for eternity. Revelation chapter 2, one of my favorite verses in verse 17 says, In the end, he will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things will be gone forever. And so we look forward and trust that even in the brokenness we live in now, there is a plan where God will return and make all things right. There will be no more disease. There will be no more racism. There will be no more poverty. There will be no more storms and loss and viruses and death. That in eternity, God will make right all that we suffer through in this flesh. And thirdly, in this one, there is an eternal judgment, which means we live in this world and we go, well, why does it seem like bad people get all the good things and their lives are great and good people suffer? In a theology of another plane of existence, of understanding an eternal life, we also understand that God's judgment for the bad we do in this world doesn't end 
in this earthly life. Proverbs 11.21 says, Evil people will surely be punished, but the children of the godly will go free. For people groups that have been historically and systematically oppressed for decades, generations, and centuries, for those that hold to Christ Jesus as Savior have been able to say, I will fight for freedom and for justice, but I will trust that that justice may not come in my lifetime and may not ever come on this earth, but it will come in eternity when a righteous God will judge good and evil. And all those who call Christ and receive his goodness will be forgiven. And all those who have committed evil in this world without Christ will receive the punishments for their actions. Belief in an eternal life and another plane of existence empowers us to suffer well in this life because this place is not my only home. And I don't need to gather all the experiences and all the pleasures of this earth in my lifetime. I have an eternity to look forward to. And all justice may not happen on this earth, but it will happen in eternity. All right. So first, we accept this world is broken. Second, we also understand that we exist in a wider plane than just this earth. Third, we trust in the sovereignty of God. A rich theology of suffering understands that God is sovereign and trust in the character of who he is. And so like Job, when we don't understand fully what God is working, we can lean on the trust of his goodness and his character. I trust that God has an ultimate long-term plan. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, it begins to lay out that God's plan is long. It happens from Genesis to Revelation, and the recorded scriptures we have is over two to 3,000 years of history happening. Jesus Christ comes into this world as a savior and it takes him 30 years to grow up as a human before he begins his work of redemption and new life. God moves slowly and we trust the long plan of his sovereignty. And when we don't understand what God is doing, we can lean on his character, best defined by God himself in Exodus 34 verses 6 through 7. Moses asked God to reveal himself. He says, God, reveal your glory. Tell me who you are. I'm leading your people and it's kind of hard and they're not the best. And I need to know your character in this moment of suffering. And God speaks to Moses through a storm. He says, Yahweh, Yahweh, the God of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and their grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations. What is the character of God? He is a God of compassion and mercy. He is a God slow to anger with unfailing love. He is a God who is faithful, but he is also a God of righteous judgment. And in moments where, God, I don't understand what you're doing, I don't understand why this is happening, I lean back on the the theology of God's character. But God, I know that you're good. I know that you're loving and merciful. I know that you're forgiving and you're righteously just. And so in this moment, when I don't understand my circumstances, I lean on what I do understand is your character as laid out in scripture, as lived out in Jesus, and I trust in your goodness. As Charles Spurgeon writes, God is too good to be unkind, and he is too wise to be mistaken. And when we cannot trace his hand, we must trust his heart. When we can't see what God's doing, we trust in his character. And so we accept the broken world. We understand that we're made for a larger existence than just this earth. We trust in the character of God. And then fourth, we see pain as the potential for our refining. Sometimes God uses pain to grow us or shape us or prune us or build our character. That is not true all the time. And so every time you suffer, don't say, what what am I trying to learn and grow? But it is true that God uses pain as a tool to grow us. John 12, 25 says, Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. 
when we don't understand again that eternal life God has planned for us, our whole life becomes about clinging to the comfort, clinging to security, clinging to happiness. And what God says is when you lay that down and learn a theology of self-sacrifice, of leaning into suffering for other people, of releasing some of your own pleasure for the goodness of those around you, you begin to accept a greater life. Because Jesus Christ gives us the best example. As he lays down his power, as he lays down his goodness, Jesus says, when you suffer, you model me because I will suffer and die for your forgiveness and for your eternal life. And so John tells us when we suffer, we model Christ. And every moment of suffering is an opportunity to grow more like our Savior. And as you read the Beatitudes in Matthew and Luke, none of the Beatitudes are about seeking blessing to be blessed. It's about seeking mercy and the goodness of others, suffering and sacrifice to receive blessing on the other side. Peter, the early church leader, he writes this in his letter to the churches in 1 Peter. He says, So be truly glad. There is a wonderful joy ahead. Even though you must endure many trials for a little while, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold, so when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Pain is the friction that God uses to refine us. Pain is the testing of our faith to show if we trust that God is good. Do we believe in an eternity beyond this? Do we believe in the character of the goodness of our God? Do we believe in God's ability to work even though this world is broken? And in our suffering, when we remain faithful, it proves out our faith and it shapes and grows and refines us. If I spend my life looking for things to make me happy, I will not find happiness at all. No, Jesus taught sacrificial service. What do I invest my life in? If it is service, then it will most likely include pain. But Jesus calls us to this life of painful servanthood. And in losing a happy life, I find a full and rich one in Christ Jesus. All right, so fourth is pain as a means of refining. Fifth and final, theology of suffering. To view the cross as the ultimate paradox of suffering and healing. That in Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, we see the juncture point of ultimate suffering as well as God's provision of ultimate healing. Matthew 27, 46, we see the richness of Christ's suffering. About three o'clock, it says, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma samachthani, which means... My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? The pain of Christ on the cross, the pain of Jesus suffering in this moment is so rich, is so powerful that the author Matthew, as he writes it, wants us to also hear it in the original Aramaic. He wants to hear it as Jesus spoke it. So we feel the depth of God himself suffering in our place. There's no other religion not Judaism, Hinduism, Islam, Buddhism, Confucianism. No other religion lays out a rich theology of our God himself suffering like his creation. Our God came down into this earth and he suffered everything of what it means to be human. He suffered the betrayal of friends. He suffered the pain of a physical body and hunger and thirst. And he suffered the physical pain of loss, of hurt, and ultimately death. And in our suffering, God says, I won't always relieve you of your suffering, but I will always be with you in it. I will always understand it as you go through it. And what we understand by the moment of the cross is not just does God understand our pain, but he has taken the ultimate expression of our pain, our death from God eternally, our separation from the God that loves us, the weight and guilt of our sin and shame, He bore the suffering of that on the cross in our place. And he's taken our ultimate suffering from us. How does God deal with pain? He suffers through it with us. And even more, he suffers far more 
than the pain we should have by his own pain on the cross. So five aspects of a theology of suffering, the acceptance that our world is broken, a belief that this world is not our only plane of existence, the trust of the sovereignty of God, seeing pain as a potential for our refining and growth, and finally, viewing the cross as the ultimate paradox of suffering and healing. And so what happens when we have a robust theology of suffering? What does that look like? How does that transform and change us? How does that bring power into the church? That as we suffer and as we have pain, we are not people who run away from it, but we are people who run towards it. We are not people to shy away from the difficult work, but we lean into it. We are not people afraid of death, but we are people who look death in the eye and trust our Savior on the other side of it. What happens when we have a robust theology of suffering? Tim Keller writes it like this. The church historic was far more open to the poor, women, children, slaves, and the sick. In some ways, it's harder for churches today to look as compassionate to the world because secular Western society has co-opted the humanitarianism Christianity originally introduced. When we are afraid of death, we can't give up our own earthly pleasures and securities. When we are afraid of suffering, we can't lean into the difficult work to make this world better. And when we avoid a life of suffering and pain and the refining that comes from it, we lack the compassion to love those truly suffering in this world. With a theology of suffering, we suffer well and we live a life of joy the world doesn't understand because my life is not defined by this fleshly existence. I'm built for more than this and I'm built for an eternity with a God that loves me and has made me and has known me and has saved me. We have compassion on those who are suffering because we live under a savior who suffered himself and who tells us when you see anyone poor, struggling, asking for a drink of water, crying out from oppression and pain to see him in them and to join in their suffering with compassion. We live as people without fear because nothing can destroy the eternal life that Christ has bought for us and has placed in us by his Holy Spirit. And we live as people with constant peaceful hope that our God and his character will reign supreme over whatever suffering and pain we live in. If you'll pray with me today. Some of you may watch this uh, video and you may be going through your own very real suffering in this moment. You may be really afraid, anxious, or this year you have lost a ton. And in this moment, I want you to know that God has made you God has created you and he has a plan for your good and for your eternal life under his glory, protection, provision, and lordship. And I want to give you a chance today to accept his love and to accept his protection and to accept his eternal life in your life. If you'll pray this with me. Today, God, we want to trust in your character. And we want to look to Jesus, your cross, where you suffered and died in our place so that we would not suffer and die for eternity. For many of us, God, we are tired and we are afraid of what comes next in this world and how to live in this one. And Jesus, will you teach us? Will you guide us? And will you provide us with your spirit so that we know we have the power to live in this life and we have your power for eternity in the next. Jesus, I believe that you came to this earth as God. You lived for 33 years. You died on the cross for my suffering and shame. And you rose from the grave to conquer death and provide eternal life to each and every one of us. You gave your life to me. Today, I commit my life to follow you. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me for the first time or first time long time, I just invite you to click the link below here and just let us know as we'd love to celebrate with you, equip you, and walk alongside you as you discover the fullness of life in following Jesus. I thank you for joining me for this teaching of Pennington AG Church Online.